I must admit, I didn't know this man was behind so many of our modern isms in art. And they began in a mind that he himself compared to a master criminal's. But why? Was it for taking the smile away from the Mona Lisa? Was it because he passed this off as a sculpture? Or was it to do with that new decomposing on his staircase? And why should Sherlock Holmes want to investigate him? Was his vanity touched by suggestions in some art journals that the man was imitating him? Holmes, my dear fellow, I got your telegram. The game's afoot. Just like the old days. I know. I thought you'd retired to take up philosophy and agriculture. You may have. All I wanted to do was to get away from the traffic in Baker Street and keep a few bees. Right. But what is the nature of this game? Art. I never thought of you as an art connoisseur. Ah, but in between milking the cows, reaping the corn, and knocking off ten volumes on the meaning of life, I have managed to find the odd moment to burn up a little. You do go on. Besides, have you forgotten that I was born to it? On my grandmother's side, the Vernes. I always suspected you were making that up. Until I checked it in my dictionary of art. There was a whole family of painters of that name. Very odd. Art in the blood is liable to take the strangest forms. So you said. The case of the Greek interpreter. And perhaps never more bizarre than in the veins of Marcel Duchamp. The client? The suspect. That's what makes this such an interesting case, Watson. We know the culprit. He admits he's guilty. The trouble is, nobody has ever been quite sure exactly what it was he did. Well, you always used to say a well-executed crime is like a work of art. I suppose the reverse could be true. But there must be something we can pin on him. Forgery? Theft? Well, he did sign a few things that weren't strictly his. And in a way, he stole the Mona Lisa. You have to be so enigmatic. I'm not. He is. Ah, putting yourself in the mind of your adversary. I find being Duchamp strangely congenial. It's as if I were looking into a mirror. Though he's every bit as devious and cunning as Moriarty. This could be quite a story. I don't want this finishing up in that trunk full of unpublished manuscripts. But they're your unsolved. You could sell it to television. Scotland Yard obviously don't read anymore. I take it they haven't called on your services lately. This will put you back in business. The case of Marcel Duchamp. Et voilà. What is it? A bomb? A trap for boobies, definitely. You have to approach it with your wit about you. Parts of it will make you explode with laughter, and it sends up a great deal of what we solemnly venerate as art. He designed it as a portable museum of his own work. What, like a travelling salesman's box of samples? Or a conjurer's outfit. What en valise, he called it. Box in a case. What en malice is a French jack-in-the-box? Well, our investigation of it will undoubtedly be full of surprises. We'll need Toby's help to follow its twists and turns. Toby? That mongrel? He could follow a scent as well as any bloodhound. Well, he can't still be alive. He's been reincarnated electronically. I bred him myself. The home's computer. Oh, so that's where all your files have gone. Toby can digest anything. He's also a very good retriever. Brings everything back on his screen and loudspeaker. He responds to the keyboard, but he's voice activated too. Have you found an up-to-date equivalent for your other erstwhile assistants, the Bow Street runners? I do have a helpful film crew who scout for information to supplement these. It was from them I got the idea that to understand Duchamp's oeuvre, one should see it as a chessboard, each piece a calculated move. An appealing thought. Duchamp plays art. I play Duchamp. Holmes, the theory already. 
I am too eager for the chase. Well, if this is to be documented for television, we'd better start with photographs and details of his early life. They always do. I loathe the predictable. But you love publicity. Oh, very well. Toby can zoom around the family album. And I'll supply the know-all commentary. Born 1887 in a bourgeois home. Normal infancy, though he recalled his mother as rather cold and indifferent. He did have a warm attachment to one of his sisters, Suzanne. For several years, they were the only children in the house and were as close as two conspirators. He looks a little unhappy in military dress, but he seems to have enjoyed his childhood. He liked his father, a kind and cultured lawyer, and he revered his older brothers, who'd become artists. During their visits, they'd talk about books, play cards, music, and the family passion, chess. Marcel learned to play a wily game when he was 11. He grew up in a sleepy Normandy village. The house overlooked the church, though he found a better view. When he was eight, a street lamp went up in the square outside. And what could compete with that? There was nature close enough in the spacious grounds, but it was all very peaceful and very dull. The only comparable excitement was by the little stream that ran near the house. All along its valley were signs of its modest power being put to the most ingenious use. He went to school in Rouen. While he was there, his ambitions turned to art, and that meant Paris. Taking his brother's example, at 17, he went to live in what was then the Bohemian Quarter, Montmartre, where he found even more signs of excitement. The domestic gas and water supply, especially gas. Advertisements associated its incandescent vitality with a delighted and usually half-naked female. Oh, well, there's no shortage of clues. What they're all adding up to, it's damn puzzling. Well, think of a jigsaw. Observation will show us how the pieces fit. Electricity might help. Had been invented by then. Thank you. Now, I make it 1904 when he arrived in Paris. Content for a while to follow the various artistic isms flourishing there at the time. Because we don't know what you're going to do, you don't know you are going to do anything else. It took me 10 years or more to change the style, at least to say, where well, there's nothing more in the Impressionism to find. And I went through Fauvism, I went through Cubism, and then it's only in 1912 or 13 that I found more or less what I wanted to do, which would not be influenced by movements that I'd been through, you see. He began before he left home, a conventional opening. Well, when you are 15 and uh, paint like the Impressionists, they, you're experimenting with yourself. With money affecting him, he did the landscape behind the house, his first painting, 1902. But while he was still at the Lycée, he'd made a detailed study of a Beck Hour gas mantle hanging over his head in the classroom. A portrait of his father in 1910 was, he said, typical of my cult of Cezanne, mixed with filial love. The influence of Cezanne, his card players in particular, was evident in another of Duchamp's works of 1910. While their wives have tea, his brothers get absorbed in chess. The same year, he turned his devotions to another fashion in Paris, intimate scenes of women. 
This laundry barge shows that he discovered Matisse and the Fauves with their vivid brushwork. But he brought a little more than the Fauvist palette into this portrait of a doctor. It's dedicated with the words, about your figure, dear Dumochel. Note the red aura surrounding the body. We may infer that Duchamp, like his medical friend, was intrigued by research which claimed that mental states can be seen outside the human form. Bringing scientific speculation into art clearly amused him, but so did painting allegories. Dumachel posed as Adam in a version of paradise. The cubist method had developed from Cezanne's, and Duchamp now applied it to his earlier derivative of the master concentrating his studies on the psychological space of the game. The final oil in 1911 shows the mental combat as a pattern of thoughtful heads. It was painted under the glare of a gas jet so that, viewed by day, it would have the subdued tones required for things newly seen in the light of cubism. But he felt there was something missing from the cubist formula. Life can be so boring if you keep it still. <sighs> the missing factor was suggested by the work of Mybridge and Marais. Despite what had always been accepted in painting, all four feet of a horse can be off the ground at the same time as Mybridge, using sequential photography, showed. He was also an assiduous student of human mobility. Murray found Mybridge's discoveries so remarkable that he predicted a revolution in art when painters would be provided with those true attitudes of movement, momentarily stabilized in transition, which no model could hold. Murray invented many devices to explore motion, including a photographic gun. He pioneered chronophotography, the exposure of successive images on a single plate, and he often used a light bulb or white markings on his subject to record a diagram of the actions. Duchamp saw how all this could take the revolution, which the Cubists had started, even further. A moving subject would not only provide more interesting viewpoints than any static one, it would give more scope to the imagination. The woman he'd often watched strolling in the park became an unsuspecting model. As she walks and turns in five sequential aspects, she is gradually undressed, retaining only the hat as a symbol of her original identity. There may be a sly reference to the five figures in Picasso's Damoiselle d'Avignon. What Duchamp was trying to contribute to the Cubist formula was, as he put it, a demultiplication of the image. His Lady Dulcinea was a rather clumsy attempt. He spoke disparagingly of its wishy-washiness. Well, you should have tried it on guitars or bottles. They don't move very far, but a machine could. A coffee grinder. Well, that works all right. Very impressive. Not to give an impression of movement, it was on the contrary, a diagrammatic, diagrammatic form of depicting what the movement is supposed to be, I mean, mechanically speaking. Well, he speaks like a cubist. Says four different things at the same time. On reflection, it's quite transparent. He was a thoroughgoing cubist in his desire to catch the underlying idea of something rather than its mere appearance, and in realising that to catch an idea, he must invent some new kind of visual notation. The idea of circular motion could be reduced to the arrow. Later on, more complex ideas would be reduced further to dots and lines. But he tried the technique next on his own head, portraying it as he travelled in a railway carriage, jolting along. An artist, he was realising, could use any kind of symbol to say anything he wanted. 
In that picture, we may deduce he was talking as much about the state of his mind as about the spasmodic movements of his body. On it was inscribed, Marcel Duchamp, naked, sad young man in a train. Any evidence why he should be sad? Circumstantial. He just returned from a wedding. Suzanne, the sister who'd been his childhood playmate, had just married a pharmacist in Rouen. Whatever his feelings, they were expressed in coded form, his new kinetic cubism. He did admit later that his identity was symbolized by his habitual pipe, if it is a pipe. Seems to be a gland in his head, penile rather than pineal. Now for some moves that would surprise everyone. To illustrate a poem by La Forgue, he'd made a little sketch with a naked figure taking a few steps up towards a head. A few years earlier, he'd posed a nude on a ladder, who seems reluctant to go down. But there was reason for thinking that was the best way to go. done in the musicals, he thought, was quite majestic. And the picture that would bring him his first notoriety began as an undress rehearsal, with a form demultiplying from top to bottom. The staircase was seen from a conventional point of view in version number one, but for the performance itself, in about a cubism, that was fragmented on all sides, while the figure makes a spectacular entrance, according to Duchamp, wearing nothing more than the abstract lines of some 20 different static positions in the successive action of descending. The new descending staircase is inspired by cubism, naturally, but there was something more important for me in that case was the publication of the fencing or horse galloping and so forth photos and that gave me the real idea for the nude. I did the king and the queen after that and it was the end of cubism for me, end of 12. He said he'd find a new way in 1912. And he would, with the help of writers, especially poets. Now here's a motive for you. Duchamp wanted to give the lie to an old French saying as stupid as a painter. One reason he admired Mallarmé for demanding that the arts return to an intellectual instead of an animal expression. Also on his list of greats, Alfred Jarry, pursuing the ridiculous to attain the sublime. And there was Jules Lafogue. Some of these names don't mean much to me. Because you prefer thrillers to French literature of the late 19th century. There's no need to pontificate. But I enjoy it so. Le Fogue was the quintessential decadent, setting himself defiantly against nature. He was a pessimist with a bleak, irreverent wit, a dandy with an insatiable appetite for ideas. There's a great deal of Le Fogue in Duchamp, I suspect. Duchamp at first called this pauvre jeune homme the title of a Lafourg lament. He put the title on the back of the original. And why include this rudimentary illustration if not to draw attention to the poetic source from which the new descended? He put its title boldly on the front so we can see its significance. N. U. That's masculine. It would have to be N-U-E to be a woman. That is surprising. Perhaps it's a hermaphrodite. Well, don't ask me. You're the detective. Then permit me to present you with a few more pertinent facts. Duchamp testified that he felt a deep affinity with another ambiguous figure, Hamlet, the character that Lafogue recreated in one of his poetic stories. His mournful prince thinks and doubts until he sees no point in anything. 
If he's Hamlet, he'd have a lot in his mind. He'd be haunted, too, by a ghost. The father of all French thought, Descartes. The way it's taught in the schools is virtually another religion for the French. Cartesian philosophy. Oh, really, Holmes, you are jumping about a bit. In 1912, Duchamp was to go through a period of rapid change in which he would assimilate all these influences and come out knowing what he had to do. Let's hear about it from the horse's mouth. It's true that Aurelie was very much of a Cartesian. Defroqué, which means unfrocked Cartesian, because I was very pleased by using Cartesianism as a form of thinking, logic and mathematical thinking. Yet I was also very pleased by the idea of getting away from it. It happened also in several plays of Roussel, who wrote these completely fantastic descriptions where everything can be done, especially when you describe it in words, anything can be invented. And in uh, Impression d'Afrique, that's where really I found the source of my new activity in 1911 or 12. Roussel, another unfamiliar name, I'm afraid. Roussel was only popular with the avant-garde to his dismay. The general reception of his prose and poetry was so disappointing that he had to have psychiatric treatment for the anguish he suffered. He was convinced that his work was destined for a wider and more appreciative audience, and he thought it would reach it if he adapted his impressions for the stage. Although Duchamp read the book, it was in its theatrical form that he first encountered it, in Paris, in 1912. He said it was tremendous, absolutely the madness of the unexpected. King Talu has said that, ransom or not, Louise and I will only be set free if our creations meet his stipulations. He'd seen me carving figures out of the local clay, so he demanded I build a life-sized statue. As he'd been so thrilled with the model railway found in the salvaged cargo, he wanted the sculpture to be locomotive, too. What yeah, indeed. Indeed. He also insisted that the rails on which it had to run should be made out of gelatin from the lungs of veal. Gelatin, was it? Rails of lungs of veal. That's because the dinner prepared by the ship's cook from calf lights had been so delicious. And so insubstantial. Not only that, the motion had to be controlled by our tame magpie. Yes, My sister found the answers. Rummaging through the cargo, she came across some boxes of whalebone corsets. Using the stays from these, I've been able to make this big enough, yet still light enough, to glide. Good. Good. Your Majesty. Princess. Louise. The Emperor is here. My sister also came up with a theme. It's from Thucydides. Bohinky! Oh! Zoa Shijomba! Kitinus believed that education could raise his slaves to be the equal of any citizen. And to make them study, he would punish slackness severely. But despite repeated chastisement, Saridakis showed no signs of progress. Catinus resolved on the harshest of lessons. He gave him three days to commit the verb I'd ton, I'd tain to memory. And then he would have to recite it in front of his fellow pupils, while his master held a dagger to his heart, ready to strike at the slightest mistake. I find that excessive. Oh, well, teach him. Saridakis could not decline the invitation, so he had to learn the forms of the verb. He made heroic efforts to do so, and on the day, the slaves were called together, and the blade was put to the helot's breast. Alas, he made an error in the duel of the air is tense. In the anguished silence, 
resounded a mortal blow. Saridakis expired, with the verb at last conjugating correctly upon his lips. Alas, That's too late to learn. Lazoale, enkuri, jijin dun. Zua, enkad, zi. A most instructive tale. Proceed at once with the demonstration. Your Immaculate Highness may be interested to note that there are small openings in the back of the plinth. By inserting his beak into them, the bird releases a spring which operates the mechanism. Hippa! Hippa! Bijou! Stop now. Monsieur la Biloudière Maisonnelle. My fencing machine. There is a foot pedal which turns the grindstone, which through a certain arrangement of cogs, levers, and springs, extends its momentum to the mechanical arm. Moving this rod alters the dispositions of the internal gears, so changing the action of the foil, if modesty permits. I believe I can claim no swordsman can best it. The champion of France accepts the challenge. Gentlemen, machine, let the duel commence. Bizarre impressions he got of Africa. Roussel's work was nothing to do with his travels. It was pure, if eccentric, invention. The details and the plot were all the result of his idiosyncratic methods. One of them was to find two unrelated words, each with more than one meaning. He'd link them by a preposition in a phrase that in the normal meaning of the words made sense. But taking the words in their more unusual meaning, the same coupling was rather strange, and he had to create fantastic characters and contraptions to justify its inclusion. Roussel concocted a narrative which has some Europeans shipwrecked on the African coast. They and the cargo are captured by a native emperor, Talu, who holds them for ransom. To avoid the dire consequences of boredom, they form the Incomparables Club, and each member has to present a spectacular demonstration of his inventiveness. Toby will synthesize some more glimpses of what must have set Duchamp going. His dear friend succumbed to a fever which never abated. He felt inconsolably at fault for her death and, torn with grief, returned to his native land, bringing, as though holy relics, the little garments she had made for him. Now, it is my contention that if he could pass once more through those tormenting aspects of his biography, the mania that has seized him would be expunged. Break it up. Under my guidance, reliving the past would be therapy itself, and the means to induce it are at hand. I have invented a device to activate this surface, an assemblage of light 
lens and spools containing diaphanous strips which have been delicately tinctured. Fifty, fifty. Sakatanda, Apu Watu. Top, top, top. Ooh, ooh, wa. Ni, Nina, Nina. Placed before such a screen, the acuteness of the perceptions is so raised one takes for reality mere luminous projections from finely colored films. At the heart of my invention lies my discovery of a certain metal. With the honor reserved for one who admits something entirely new into the elemental order, I have named it after myself, Bex E. Um. Among its remarkable qualities is that of changing its mass while retaining its volume in proportion to the temperature to which it is submitted. I could dilate upon it, but suffice to say, a fragment of the metal responding to the variations in temperature which I will induce will impart its vibrations to these devices of prodigious sensitivity. And as they are in part composed of Bexi um, they will be able, despite their miniature and unusual form, to replicate any piece that is familiar to us in the musical repertoire. And the red cylinder produces any extreme of heat, the white any intensity of cold. By manipulating these valves, I regulate the emission of their contents through the ducts and into the chamber, and the bexium reacts in accord. Louise thought the first light of day would lend a certain poetry to her experiment. Ah, so we're to find out at last what she's been up to in that hut. She's been extracting the essence of a strange red plant the magpie found. She'd send it out scouting for specimens. That's why we came to Africa. She thought that what she needed might be found growing wild in the interior. Uh, then Tolu caught us. Louise, we're here. Why has she had it made all black and no door? to stop unwanted light getting in. And it has to be hermetically sealed. She's developing something very special. But the roof, it looks to be a very light affair, made of paper. The fair made of Perth, actually. There has to be some light to work by. Louise was in a fix until Monsieur Juliard kindly offered us the pages from his old copy of the book to use as tiles. Being yellow with age, they filter the daylight safely. <laughs> Me with these. Oh, that tropical garden will be perfect for my first experiment in automatic reproduction.
Ready. Ready. My life's work has been a quest to isolate that motive force which is sufficiently precise to guide a pencil or brush. I have been frustrated by the lack of a certain oil, but I have at last been able to distill it. Thrilling, a quiver with promise. I come to the moment of joy. begins with a sensitized plate. The matrix orders the impressions of light which it receives. And by the principles of electromagnesis, they are transmitted as polychromatic sensations through the wires to the battery, where with the aid of electricity, they are communicated to the brushes on the arm. Uh, Mademoiselle Louise, uh, forgive me being inquisitive, but those wonderful noises that emanate from you. <laughs> My researches in France for the essential oil led me to inhale corrosive fumes, a tumor formed in my lungs. This impeded the expulsion of air and it became urgent to provide an artificial means for its escape. To ensure that this was working at all times, the releasing pipes had to produce audible signs. And as I was to leave for perilous foreign climbs, I decided to adopt male attire. An officer's uniform would allow the sounding tubes to be disguised as epaulettes. Extraordinary, but described in the most matter-of-fact way which makes it even more a delirium of imagination. What Duchamp says he admired in Roussel. He had found another conspirator. He admitted as much. Impressions of Africa showed me the way. A few weeks after he'd seen the play, he made a trip to Munich. Alone there, he began to examine a theme that had also preoccupied La Forgue, celibacy and the loss of innocence. It was explored in a first research for the bride stripped bare by the bachelors, who are presumably the two rampant figures on each side. Caught in the middle, she responds to their robotic proposals with what the inscription calls a mechanical modesty. There are traces of chronophotography in that. And in his subsequent studies, Virgin Number 1 and Virgin Number 2, there is something of the descending nude. But his next picture proves there is a lot more happening than a change of position. The Virgin passes into the bridal state with Duchamp, showing he could be a virtuoso in the handling of paint. The series culminated in a masterly icon, the innocent completely transformed. 
the source of it was Roussel who gave me the idea of inventing new beings, whether made of metal or of flesh. The bride is a sort of mechanical bride, a concept of a bride so that I had to put on the canvas one way or another, but I should have thought of it in words, in terms of words, before I actually drew it. Being the young man who wants to do something by himself and not copy the others, not use too much of the tradition, my research was in that direction, to find some way of expressing myself without being a painter, without being a writer, without taking one of these labels. machine with five hearts must dominate the Paris Jura Road, which, losing its topographical form, becomes pure geometric line, finding its opening in the infinite. The essence will lie in the collision of these two extremes, the road and the machinery of five nudes. This machinery will give birth to the pure child of nickel and platinum, God of the headlight, like the primitive's Jesus, radiant with glory, divine blossoming of its machine mother. A comet, conquering the road by speed, absorbing it. What was all that? Another journey. Soon after he returned from Munich, Duchamp went on a drive to the Jura with Picabe and Apollinaire. Picabe had a passion for fast motor cars. I would say that was probably a five-cylinder Peugeot. A beast that could certainly eat up the road. It inspired Duchamp to this prose fantasy, which, as it goes on, becomes a kind of sketch in words for a double-sided panel in wood. But like an altarpiece? He says the meeting of two planes is the only way to achieve pictorial purity. Have you a copy of this picture? Even purer to leave it in entirely verbal form. But why this concern for purity? Couldn't that be what the series is about? The celibate, no longer restrained to cool experiments, abandons himself to the sensuous experience of painting. In the passage from the Virgin to the Bride, He'd almost ravished the canvas, crushing and smoothing the pigments onto it with his fingers. Now, in The Bride, the climax is made with a brush. But his success brings only ennui, disgust. So he withdraws. A daring move, when it would have been so easy to go on playing the conventional game. Because everything since Courbet has been retinal, that is, the only, you look at a painting for what you see, what comes on your retina, see? You would add nothing intellectual about it, nothing else than the visual. By saying, why should we be only uh, interested in the visual par side of a painting? There may be something else to put. I can see him as Hamlet, holding Yorick's scowl as if it were the muse. What can a painting be or not be? That is the question. And the answer didn't lie in his hands. It had to be thought out. So, to further his researches, he took a job as a librarian. The Bibliothèque saint Genevieve is a prestigious academic library with fine collections. Duchamp had a minor post that gave him plenty of time to browse and work out a new strategy for his game. It was the ideal place to cogitate. For two years, he brooded, hatching his plot. 
The result was incomparable. And he did think of it in words first. Notes had to be jotted down on scraps of paper, gas bills, restaurant menus. They had to be preserved. Although they were not, unlike the Paris Jura Road, the only form it had, they were integral. Some were carefully reproduced and published in 1914 in an edition of three, each in a manufacturer's box that had held photographic plates. In 1934, this much fuller edition of 300 was issued. More surfaced later. It was the detailed description of a machine presented in the dry matter-of-fact tones of an application for a patent. The way Roussel expounded his inventions. There was a visual part. It consisted of two principal elements, the bride and the bachelors, each on their own plane, but one above the other instead of side by side. He made this part on glass, as large as a French window. Because the trouble with an oil painting and easel painting is the background. You make a portrait or you make some still life, and then comes the background. What are you going to do in the background? You put something in the background, and it always falls, or at least very seldom justified. It's just a filling up canvas. With a glass, you don't have to do that. The glass is just transparent, and you put anything behind you wish, and you change it every day if you wish as well. But the masterpiece consists in both illustration and text. I thought it was a reaction against the retinal painting because of the introduction of the conceptual. In other words, the ideas in the glass are more important than the actual visual realization. That's what he meant by putting something else in a picture. It's rather a problem, isn't it, getting to grips with an ensemble like that? Yes, exactly. That's where the difficulty comes in, because you cannot ask a public to look at something with a book in his hand and following sort of a diagram, uh, explanation, diagrammatic explanation of what he can see on the glass. So it's a little difficult to, for the public to come in to understand it, to accept it. Then why make it so difficult? Well, because I didn't want to make it easy. <laughs> well, Toby will help us out of that difficulty. He'll examine the components of the machine, starting with the bachelors. The moulds receive the illuminating gas, which they shape into male-like forms. Each has a hat with a capillary tube attached, and the gas is forced into these by the rising pressure in the moulds. Emerging from the tubes on the right, the gas passes into sieves, a dizzying labyrinth. Some of these go up through the oculus witnesses and are so dazzled they become points of light focused by a lens to reach the bride above as mirror images. The scissors open and close to control this operation. Other drops were to have set off the clockwork mechanism of a boxing match where the rams, moving up and down, unfasten the bride's clothing, represented by the horizontal midline of the whole glass.
A two-stroke action is induced by the sparks coming from the bachelors and by sparks from her own desire magneto. The internal combustions explode into a blossoming of desire. Three window displays present her demands to the bachelors and nine holes attract the mirrored drops splashing up from them. He can't be serious. I did feel his tongue in my cheek. It is a joke, all right. So he's taking on science as well as art. But to gently mock it, for trying to explain everything. It would be helpful to have a reconstruction of the events. Good thinking, Watson. Remember that the truly inventive spirit, like Roussel's characters, had to use whatever bits and pieces were lying around. Duchamp's theoretical disdain for the painterly hand didn't mean that he couldn't turn his own to improvising very subtle techniques using toys, old wire, what have you. He was a tinker and a pretty crafty one. That something else to put involved not only ideas, but methods and materials that had never been considered artistic before. We can pick up his trail in 1913 on a visit to his parents in Rouen. A beam engine powers the machines in front. On the left, a mill turns cocoa beans into pulp. This is put in the pan on the right, where two rolling wheels grind it continuously into a chocolate paste. That looks like a Leonardo da Vinci drawing. One of his devices for raising water. Toby's dug it out because he thinks it may have prompted Duchamp's fascination with the broyeurs de chocolat, though he was devising a rather dry kind of art. But he painted his icon at first in a traditional mode, modeling it with shadows and a metallic sheen. Its performance is vital to the bachelor apparatus, and it had pride of place in his calculations, which he worked out in plan, looking down on the parts as if behind the glass, and in elevation, plotting them as minutely from the front. So, although they could only be seen on the flat picture plane, they were conceived architecturally and his notes stress a crucial feature of this conception. For the classical theorists, perspective was more than a pictorial system, and Duchamp wanted his glass to be a window too, reflecting philosophically on what lay beyond. But his first meditation on a chocolate grinder didn't quite fit the position allocated to it, so it was redesigned. This time he restrained himself to the dry and mechanical extent of sewing thread on the canvas to emphasize the perspective lines. The great theorists often depicted rays of light pulled to the eye as if they were threads. He made a study of the glider to experiment with ideas and techniques. At first he tried to burn his designs on the glass with acid but the corrosive fumes threatened to put him in the same condition as Louise in Impressions of Africa, and he had to think again. He came up with lead wire, which was in everyday use for electric fuses. It was pliable enough to delineate his forms. Paint could be inserted, and lead foil would seal it in from the back. Where did those male-like shapes come from? partly from his less intellectual interests. He found the catalogues of the big stores most enthralling, and he even wanted his notes to be regarded as one. They offered all kinds of costume to make it the man and preparatory sketches for his bachelor moulds show them being fashioned on tailor's dummies. Well, they could be chessmen. They are very strategically positioned. On the surface, Duchamp's eight bachelors seem to be casually grouped, but if you connect them in depth at their crotches, you can see that they're all on the same level as far as sex is concerned. 
He'd certainly got it all worked out. Though he had asked Chance to join the gang. I used three threads of a meter long and dropped it from a meter high on a horizontal surface. And whatever the shape of the thread in falling took when it arrived at the bottom, I would keep exactly as it fell. And to fix it, I just fixed it with varnish, drops of varnish. And this operation repeated three times, gave me the, what we call the standard stoppages. It was a unit of length treated in a aesthetic form. I even call it canned chance. He cut three wooden edges to match the curves and put them in a box, like a coffin. Thus, he buried the meter as a unit of length and cast a pataphysical doubt on the whole idea of a straight line as the shortest distance between two points. Each reformed ruler was used three times over to draw a network of stoppages, in which numbers show the placing of the moulds. The capillary tubes were derived from this network. He made a study for the cemetery of liveries. It broke quite soon. We see only the outside of the nine moulds. Inside each one, a uniform is being pressed into shape. A priest, a policeman, a flunky, an undertaker... A oh, wait a minute. You said nine moulds. There were only eight just now. Well, uh, in fact, in the first place, I made eight only. And then I had a remorse of some kind because the whole thing was more or less based on the number three. Eight cannot be divided by three. Nine can. One of the Mul Maliks I called uh, the uh, station master. That was the last one, I think, I added to the eight to make nine. So there you are. And there he was. He'd got that far with the project, but it was 1915. Oh, the Great War called to arms. He thought folding his own the best way to combat invasion. He was considered unfit for military service. The chauvinistic atmosphere in France was unbearable, so he left for the land of opportunity, taking with him his notes and the scale plans. The large glass would be made in USA, as indeed would Duchamp's name. And he just upped and went? Well, he had a long-standing invitation. In 1912, four of his Cubist pictures were taken, along with a large selection of the latest European art, to be shown for the first time in the United States. The promoters, with their native genius for publicity, turned the whole thing into a circus. They goaded the press into a fury of indignation and lampoon. But the eye of the storm was a picture that had upset Paris by its subject. It scandalized the New York critics with its distortion of the female form divine. A nude should recline. It might sit. It could take a bath. But it must never, ever walk downstairs. <laughs> The press still heralded the missionary of insolence, only to find the 28-year-old Marcel full of inscrutable Gallic charm. He was taken up by a group of writers and artists who called themselves the Others and linked up with Walter Ahrensberg, who became his disciple and patron. Another admirer of his work offered him $10,000 a year if he'd do more paintings like the nude. Duchamp hated to repeat himself and gave French lessons instead. But, even if only for a few hours a day, he was determined to continue his plan. The Munich picture was, in effect, a study for the bride, which he tried to reproduce on the glass photographically. But he had to paint it on, 
rendering in oils the black and white tonality of a photographic print. He kept only the essentials. From the notes, we learn that she hangs by hooks from a shiny metal gallows, simulating an attachment to her relatives. I take this to mean that she has some affinities with tradition. Her blossoming is a sensuous display of pigment, typical of a classic nude. As for those mysterious shots which pull the bachelor's drops into her orbit... You will observe, Watson, that I have lost none of my ability with the pistol. Well, I hope you warned Mrs. Hudson this time. You nearly gave her a cardiac arrest when you shot out Queen Victoria's initials back in Baker Street. Is that how those nine holes got into the glass? Ironically, yes. They were drilled through, but their placing was determined by this. He fired matches tipped with paint out of one such, from more or less far on a target, the center of which corresponds to the vanishing point of a figure projected in perspective. Even your magnificent aim couldn't do it with that toy. And it would make an artist's skill nonsensical. Perhaps it was a playful reference to Murray's photographic gun. In Duchamp's case, resorting to such an inanely crude method could be a means of poking fun at art when it tried to represent reality. We'll return to that satirical motive. For the moment, let us reenact the making of the sieves, which transform the gas as it goes through. In 1918, he made a study, which eventually cracked, for the last cryptic features of the bachelors. The erect pointer indicates the way the drops are to go, after they have spurted out of the sieves and splashed around it. Before these bachelor secretions can enter the bride's peculiar space, they have to be optically transformed. And the transposition was suggested by the dazzling paradoxical form at the top of the study. In the large glass, this would be reduced to dots and lines. The bride's garment was represented simply by the horizontal line dividing the two parts. An old perspective study has the model's robe falling onto the horizon line as the artist would see it through his perspective window. But instead of the artist's eye, its viewpoint fixed by the obelisk, we find stuck on the glass an ordinary Kodak lens to catch the world beyond, or what looks into it. The splash below the pointer is such a chart, seen tilted away from us. For the large glass, of course, he had to have three oculists, to witness the stripping of the bride. They're also shown in perspective. But the circle above, representing the Kodak lens, is not. So we are invited to put our own eye to it. And we do become peeping toms. These witnesses seem to be etched on the glass. Negatively, yes. He had the back of it covered in mirror silver in that area. The motifs were then transferred from carbon paper to the glaze. With a very sharp blade, he then had to scrape away the surrounding silver, leaving them intact. The rest of the form was already on the glass, so he had to be careful not to make one single mistake. This tedious, exacting work continued on and off for four years. In 1923, he decided it was definitely incomplete. But after making all those detailed plans, Hardly surprising. There was nothing of this uh, satisfaction, see, physical satisfaction of 
painting and what you call the splash, you know, the, the brushing or something of a painter, looking at it and finishing it in 10 minutes or anything like that. So after eight years of it, you just say, enough, enough, let's enough. And sometimes there's something in abandoning a work before the finishing, because the finishing sometimes, you know, the Schubert, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Leonardo da Vinci could never bring himself to complete a picture, could he? You amaze me, Watson. The glass gradually came to belong to Walter Ahrensberg in lieu of rent. In 1918, he sold his rights in it to Catherine Dreyer, another collector who had come under Duchamp's spell. In 1926, she put it on show at the Brooklyn Museum. On display, the bride and the bachelors were kept apart like lovers before their wedding. When they were dismantling it, the workmen put them into a crate. Thrust close together in this tight embrace, the result was, quite literally, shattering. You mean this case is about to break wide open? You've been reading too much Raymond Chandler, Watson. They were kept in store for 10 years. No one knew about the damage. And Duchamp must have been shattered when he did find out. Well, no, I was not, because I'm fatalist, maybe enough to take anything as it comes along. And fortunately, a little later, when I look at the brakes, I love the brakes. It took him the whole of 1936 to restore the fragments. In the 1960s, its fame grew, and it was in demand for international exhibitions. As it was too fragile to travel, he sanctioned replicas, one in Sweden and one in England, made by Richard Hamilton for the Tate Gallery. So there are now three large glasses. The copies have remained intact? So far. Duchamp felt that the cracking of his glass had brought it back into this world. But where had it been? And what did it bring back with it? He published this in 1934, in that edition of 300. The following year, the first major essay on it came out by André Breton. He saw it as a great modern legend. He called his essay, Fire de la Mariée, The Lighthouse of the Bride urging that the glass be kept luminously erect to guide future ships on a civilization which is ending. Since that seminal piece, the legend has attracted endless interpretations. It has become the Rosetta Stone of modern art, with the hermeneutics as formidable. Well, then what better precept than your own? That all theories be considered on their merits, rejected only in the light of facts. <laughs> A psychoanalyst might find a twist in that tale. Pronounce it mem, and you have... Loves me? Who does? Well, wishful thinking, perhaps, but it could be Suzanne. Oh, the sister who married the Rouen pharmacist. We also have the stuff that psychoanalysis is made of. Dreams. Duchamp recounts a nightmare that he had in Munich. He came back from a beer hall to the hotel room where he was painting the bride. In his sleep, she became an enormous beetle which tortured him with its elytra. If you look closely at some of her forms, she seems to be crawling with insects. That could even be the chrysalis of a butterfly. Hold on, Holmes. You've got everything in it except your bees. The hive is far too well organized to be a metaphor for the human condition. However, experiments have shown, have they not, that certain insects will continue to mate enthusiastically, even when their brain has been removed. Well, in the lower organisms, sexual activity is a function of the automatic nervous system. Is Homo sapiens in the grip of passion? 
Does he not lose his head when aroused? Such could be Duchamp's wry comment. How can you deduce that? Elementary, my dear Watson. I observe that the bride and the principal bachelor form, the chocolate grinder, have nothing above the neck. That could express the loss of something else. Bayonet is French slang for a penis. And the grinder's bayonet supports the scissors. Castration anxiety. It all fits, Holmes. Rather too neatly. The theories of psychoanalysis are beautiful as poetry, but facts just pass them by. There does seem to be a down-to-earth origin for these decapitated figures. It really took birth in my mind from the fairs where they have the wedding scene and you have big balls that you, you throw at the heads of the bride, of the bridegroom and the guests. <laughs> That's an influence that I can admit. And as a child, how delighted he would have been with his science amusante. This English version has the same playful physics as the French original. The large glass is a sum of experiments, according to his notes. They also tell us that the bachelor machine has solid foundations and rests on firm ground. However, several commentators have seen it going back deep into alchemy. Its practitioners used elaborate written and visual allegories to preserve the secret of their operations, in which the number three was crucial. The elements, regarded as opposing principles, were conceived as a triad, with salt as the agent of harmony. These opposites were frequently symbolized by male and female. The philosopher's aim was to unite them, and this joining together was expressed by a marriage, usually regal. Although perfect unity might be the sexes becoming one as a hermaphrodite. To further baffle the uninitiated, a variety of emblems might be used for the same operation, and each emblem could signify several different things. The tree, however, always stood for knowledge, and the star was the accepted hieroglyph for salt. It's there in the leaves. The seven known metals associated with the seven planets had to pass through seven stages in the long process of distillation. This involved endless grinding, heating and filtering to yield a few drops of perfectible liquid. Progress was indicated by changes in colour, so dyeing and tinting became a sign for what was essential to the hermetic art. Finding the Philosopher's Stone was fundamental too, but this priceless catalyst could be lying around anywhere, in the form of the most ordinary object, ignored as junk by the ignorant. They wouldn't recognize its value, even if it was manifest threefold in the clouds. For the true alchemist, producing gold from something as base as lead symbolized his real target, freedom from the grossness of everyday life and the achieving of pure enlightenment. Although his was an individual and lonely quest, the adept could be aided by a mystical sister. She would help in the final transmutation, when the childlike Mercury, born from the chemical union, would appear in the alchemic vessel to guide the material to its state of perfection. Fascinating, Holmes, but... Duchamp's journey on the Paris Jura Road, was that not symbolic? And what appeared in the headlights? The pure child of nickel and platinum. The whole conception was based on the collision of opposites, and we may get a glimpse of that metallic infant elsewhere. This 1911 painting, an allegory, interpreted as brother and sister reaching into a tree, and in the file between them, a small androgynous mercury. An oil of 1912 
called The King and Queen Surrounded by Speedy Nudes, has the two principal elements in a state of flux. That first research he did in Munich has an uncanny resemblance to an alchemic emblem, where the stripping of the bride to reveal her virginity signified that matter could only be transformed when it was free from corruption. In the glass itself, we find plenty of lead. We have the grinder to prepare materials, a threefold apparition in the clouds, crucibles from which vapors are drawn off in tubes to pass through seven changes, while mercury appears in a triple form, as quick as mirror silver, guiding the drops on their way to the circle, a hieroglyph for gold. Chemical reactions, apparatus, allegorical appearance. Well, there's much more to this than meets the eye. We've had strange enough solutions to other cases. Alchemy would not be the most obscure. It would also explain some of the other things that Duchamp got up to around this time. In 1922, he started a fabric dyeing business in New York. It went bankrupt in six months. But he joked, at least he could call himself a tonturier. Tinting, the essential art. Then there was the nom de plume he used for a little book of his puns, Marchand du Sel. Cellar of salt. Alchemy could have shown him an analogy of how the artist should pursue his solitary researches. But he was interrogated on this very subject. And? He said, if ever I have practiced alchemy, it was in the only way one can nowadays, without knowing it. Found the vital clue yet, gentlemen? Clues galore, Mrs. Hudson. But we are no nearer. You'll be much warmer after this. Gentlemen's relish, homemade bread and wine. Mrs. Hudson's using my old chemistry apparatus for her concoction. Mm hmm Dry. It should age well. You've started to be off again. This is just to keep you going. Supper's nearly ready. Thank, Thank you, you, Mrs. Hudson. Hudson. Is that another arcane allusion? There is a note relating it to the seven sieves, also known as drainage slopes. Remember the point about the nine holes? I'm afraid it's rather vanished. The figure obtained is the visible flattening, a stop on the way of the demultiplied body. Put those clues together, Watson. Commentary, slopes, stops on the way, holes, body, sun, the stations of the cross, Calvary. You've hit it on the nail, one might irreverently say. I don't get the connection. It's literary. Alfred Jarry wrote a witty, if sacrilegious little piece called The Passion Considered as an Uphill Bicycle Race. Here's the condensed flavor of it. Barabbas had to be scratched from the race, but Pontius Pilate pulled out his clepsydra, a water clock, which made his hands wet and gave the start. Jesus got away well, but then a bed of thorns punctured his tires all round. The two robbers took the lead. There are 14 turns on the difficult Golgotha course. Jesus had a bad spill at the third. His trainer, Simon the Cyrenian, should have been out in front cutting the wind, but he did carry the bike for a while. Jesus fell again at the seventh and for the third time at the 11th. The deplorable accident with which we're all familiar took place at the 12th, when Jesus was in a dead heat with the thieves. We know he continued the race airborne, but that's another story. Even the sacred isn't sacred anymore. His own words taken down in evidence again. Yes, it had a naughty connotation with Christ. You know, Christ was stripped bare.
The bride is described as an apotheosis of virginity. Hmm. Watson, we keep looking in it, reading things out of it. We should listen to what it has to say. Some of the notes suggest a score. Toby will synthesize the soundtrack for us. Vicious circle, onanism, round trip for the buffer, monotonous flywheel, junk of love. Vicious circle, onanism, round trip for the buffer, monotonous flywheel, junk of love. Vicious circle, onanism, round trip for the buffer, monotonous flywheel, junk of love. If that's supposed to be a lighthouse, it's more like an infernal siren guiding the future onto the wreckage of our civilization. It's in the key of our times, Watson. Major confusion. Your hideous serenades are no consolation. Delay in glass. We mustn't overlook that subtitle. It's underlined twice in the notes. Delay in glass? Another enigma? Not if you take it musically. A chord that may or may not be resolved. Oh, no, we're not going to be left in suspense. The bride was left hanging in the air. Oh, you are infuriating, Holmes. Surely we've enough evidence now. Not enough for conviction. Sooner or later he'll return to the scene, Watson. They always do. My notes are full of interrogation marks. Should one look to art for answers? They only bring you to a full stop. Questions are so much more interesting, don't you think? In this case, there may be no solution, simply because there is no problem. Problem is the invention of man. It is nonsensical, as Duchamp says. Nevertheless, our investigation still isn't complete. Neither is the large glass. No. But we can't compromise on our methods. My dear Watson, what is life itself? but a compromise between birth and death. I propose we adjourn this inquiry. Let's go and eat. First sensible idea I've heard since I arrived. <clears throat> when is a door not a door? Oh, I really am too old for that kind of question. Duchamp asked it in a very ingenious way. He was living in Paris in a very cramped apartment. One room, basically, we drove onto a hallway outside, but inside the room was a very tiny bathroom. So we had a door made that was hinged so that when it was open to the hallway, it was closed to the bathroom inside, and vice versa. Just keeping his options open. With Duchamp, nothing is ever just. It is also a neat refutation of the Cartesian dialectic. If you say so. Look, I really am extremely hungry. According to Descartes, a door must either be open or shut. There are no two ways about it, yes or no. The same binary logic on which Toby functions and on which the entire modern computerized world has placed its faith. But must everything be one thing or the other? Could there not remain the human possibility of doubt? Holmes. I don't care whether I am or not. I doubt the word to be. <laughs> Oh, dear. Toby's not giving up the scent. Suppose I started the glass, and then I would go on making the glass and making very meticulous technique and so forth. But probably one day I woke up and said, why should I be so meticulous? Contradicting myself again. And I did by thinking of the ready-made. I suppose that was the psychology of it. The 
first one was in uh, 1913. It was a bicycle wheel, like a fire in a fireplace. You know, it has that attraction of something moving in the room while you think about something else. Then the second one was a bottle dryer. You know, they have in, in cellars, in the French cellars. And uh, I just chose it. And that's what the definition of a ready-made is. It's the choice of the artist is enough to transfer it from a functional or industrial form into supposed to be aesthetic, but very much very different from aesthetic in general. It takes away all the technical jargon of painting. Painting it should be made with colors. Painting should be made with pencil, with brushes. So it was a form of denying the possibility of defining art. And because you don't define electricity, you just see the results of electricity, but you don't define it. Then the ready-made comes in as a sort of irony, because it says, here it is, a thing that I call art. I didn't even make it myself. Another one was the uh, vial. I was in Paris in uh, 1919, and I went to a drugstore and said, will you give me a vial? that you'll empty of whatever serum is in it and seal it again, and what will be in it will be Paris, air, air of Paris. Of course, it had to be. <laughs> the, the jury, there was no jury, but the people who were organizing it decided it couldn't be shown. I didn't know it was I, I was concerned with it because I didn't sign my name, as you know, the Mutt name instead. Joconda was another thing that um, I made it here in Paris in 1919 before going back to America. And, uh, well, it was one of these gestures because I added an inscription, which is another ready-made, but its own kind, called ready-made aided or assisted, which means that I added something to it and also wrote underneath something very risky. <laughs> I don't care about the word art because it's been so discredited and so forth. An artist would be much better if I could change it instead of anti-artist. A-N, artist, meaning no artist at all. That would be my conception. I don't mind being an anarchist. An <laughs> if there's so much wrong with art, spending eight years on a glass wouldn't help. Ready-mades only add to the offence. He didn't claim to be innocent. The only way out was to take on a new identity. Oh, well, what's in a name? A great deal in this case. Rose, c'est la vie. Change sex, the ultimate disguise. Seek her, Toby. He said he liked the name because it was so vulgar. While Marcel was stuck in the mold of the recluse, she could pass right through the glass, taking all precious ideas of art with her. Her name might not smell very sweet, but she did lend it to a perfume with her initials in mirror writing, the way Leonardo did. In 1924, she made a brief appearance disguised as Marcel, wearing a false beard. 
It was during the interval of Eric Satie's ballet Relash, which means no performance today. She had a large glass of her very own, a French window whose leather panes required daily polishing but remained impenetrable. Widow, verve in French, is slang for the guillotine, a fate for those who get too fresh with rose. Tart. But the blonde bomb could come out of his shell to make an exhibition of herself. At a surrealist event designed by Duchamp in 1938, she wore his hat and jacket with a red light bulb in the breast pocket. A warning that art could easily be prostituted? But they both realized it was a business like any other. Here's their card. The whiskers were the sort given to the Mona Lisa with such precision, as was the kick in the behind, or cul in French, hence occulism. Further kicks were to be had from the manufacture of opticiaries. They made a prototype with rotating glass plates. You're right, Toby, they also experimented with film. It was seven minutes long. As a silent movie, it had captions between the scenes, nine altogether. Of course. Elaborate and very suggestive puns, which, however, you're not given time to read. He ventured into mass production on a modest scale with the 12 rotoreliefs he designed. He had several hundred printed and hired a stall at a 1935 inventors' fair in Paris. As a benevolent technician, he demonstrated how they were to be played on a gramophone at 33 revolutions a minute. But his attempt to sabotage the art market with these cheap cardboard multiples was a flop commercially. He had more success in 1924, when he issued shares in a roulette system he'd devised. He and the investors broke even. Everyone supposed he'd given up painting, but he said, now I draw on my luck. It could be, as Rose and he showed, a performance, or even body art. With all this other activity going on, no wonder his New York studio in 1917 was so bare. But he obviously thought it was reflected in his large glass. The placing of the tiny replica of ready-mades in his box of tricks is most artful. Hanging up in the air for the bride, and alongside the line representing the bride's garment, a provocative typewriter cover, which could be taken for a woman's skirt. While that teases us with our desire to see things, we are reminded that in the bachelor's domain, the fall of water has only to be implied. He was also careful to arrange that his work be housed together in a real museum in Philadelphia. The public has its part to play. The creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work into contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting and thus adds his contribution to the creative act. And what do you make of the glass, Toby?
It was a meticulous study of the technique by which mate can be avoided and play indefinitely prolonged. Sounds rather erotic. That was always a factor for Duchamp. He believed it was a way of bringing out in the daylight things that are usually hidden. Experimenting with moulds, he made a painted falsy he called Please Touch and a female fig leaf to resist temptation in the form of... Although virtue could triumph with... Toby's right. In 1959, he drew some additions for the glass. A faint outline of hills in the middle and the bachelor apparatus connected to an electricity supply. In 1953, he'd revived the subject of his first painting, Water and Woods, rendering the landscape explicit with talcum powder and chocolate, among other materials. And in 1948, he'd made a moulded study of a headless nude called given the illuminating gas and the waterfall. It would be the title for the whole elaborate work in which this figure would be set. An ending for his game, which he worked out in two little studios in New York during the last 20 years of his life. He kept the project secret. A bomb to go off only in public after his death in 1968. Metaphorically, he felt he had to go underground. Only by staying free of the art world could he bring the concerns of the large glass into the open. To all appearances, the artist acts like a mediumistic being who, from the labyrinth beyond time and space, seeks his way out to a clearing. What he found there involves a female torso holding up a glowing lamp in bright artificial daylight in front of a Swiss mountain landscape where water plunges endlessly into a pool. The assemblage lies beyond the door he had placed in the Philadelphia Museum. It has to be approached one person at a time as if one has to make confession of curiosity. As for what is witnessed, that is another mystery. <laughs>